Hello everyone, good morning, good evening, who, whoever is with us and uh, we are again on Ed Talk Live and uh, before we start I always tell that this this program, this show is a collaborative project of Pakistan ASCD and ELASCD and every time we try to bring best voices from the world and today we are coming up with a great, great, great topic which is actually, which must be addressed and big questions are there. So, uh, uh, before we move on, uh, Tammy, who is my wonderful co-host, and she will be introducing the, the, the guest of today, and will ask what we are going to do. So, hi, Tammy. Tell us who is with us and how are you? Hi, Omer. I am good. Of course, chuckling as we come in again with our technical difficulties that we always seem to have, but... Hey, we're on now. Um, so today we have Ayadeli Harrison. Hi, Ayadeli. Thanks for being with us today. Um, so I'm just going to go through your introduction to start, and then we'll get started on our conversation because we probably had a few people holding on, waiting for us to come on. So um, today we're really excited to have um, another really amazing educator in the field, Ayadeli Harrison, who I met um, via Kevin Simpson, who was on our show a few months ago. Um, so Ayadeli is a senior partner of education with Community Build Ventures, and, and they are a solutions-based firm committed to eliminating racial disparities by developing powerful, impactful, and racial equity driven leaders and organizations. As senior partner, Ayadeli leads the company's work in a couple of ways. Um, first, partnering alongside schools to create equitable world, world class schools. And secondly, by designing professional learning spaces for black male educators. Ayadeli is a trained civil engineer turned international math educator, which we do need to talk about, um, <laughs> professional <laughs> learning facilitator and consultant. Ayadeli has over 20 years working in the field of education, which includes 16 years serving as a classroom teacher in public and private schools in the US and an international school in South Africa. In 2006, as an IB diploma program math studies teacher, Ayadeli began facilitating professional learning experiences. To date, Ayadeli has engaged thousands of professional educators, organizational leaders, and community members representing institutions, including, but not limited to ASCD, um, the National Association of Independent Schools, the School Reform Initiative, the Fellowship Black Male Educators for Social Justice, the Coalition of Schools Educating Boys of Color, Georgia State University, and Atlantic Atlanta Public Schools. In 2017, Ayadeli co-founded a Twitter chat for um, called BME's Talk. The purpose of this chat was to provide a digital space for all black male educators to connect and share their perspective on the prof profession. Today, the BME's Talk Twitter handle has grown to 6,000 plus followers. And as director, Ayadeli has broadened the scope of BME's talk to now include designing and hosting a variety of virtual and in-person professional learning experiences designed exclusively for black male educators. So Ayadeli, you have been busy the last <laughs> couple of decades. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us today to talk about the work that you do. Umair, over to the first question there. Welcome, Adili, and uh, it's it's nice to have you on the show, and uh, we are really excited and looking forward to know more about you. But uh, the first thing is, we know a bit about your background. Tell us how how you determine determine your path, making the shift from engineer to educator. Though that that is also the same shift that I made myself. But I'm okay. not going to answer this thing. <laughs> I want to listen to you. How that shift was happening and how it how it went. Yeah, well, good day, good morning, good evening. Uh, hello to everybody. Um, thank you very much, uh, Umar and uh, Tammy, for having me. I really appreciate this opportunity to share. Um, let me see here. So how long do we have? Because <laughs> I can share a lot. But I think this dates back to, so I, I graduated from Howard University um, as an engineer in um, 
fall, uh, the winter of 2000 and went to work uh, for a transportation engineering firm. Um, didn't really like my experience within my first month and thought that, hey, what can I do about this? And I thought maybe grad school might be a great place because I spent so much time earning a degree. Let's just go to grad school. Maybe something else will work itself out. Um, by you know giving giving thanks, um, I was admitted to uh, UC Berkeley, um, their College of Engineering, and was in their civil engineering, civil and transportation program. And um, this first summer, I knew that I didn't want to return to an internship. Like I had one set up in San Francisco in the Bay Area and was ready to go. And I didn't want to. And a friend was like, why don't you come and teach with me? You know, you, you seem really great during this, um, when we're in tutorial sessions and learning like statistics was something that was a challenge for me. Um, but like the learning and teaching people how to do it was, was something that a friend of mine um, had suggested. And so I took two teaching jobs that summer. I taught a, um, in a program called Mesa, which is now, they now it's STEM, you know, um, in California, where I, where I taught a uh, engineering projects course to fifth and sixth graders. And then that was in the morning. Then the afternoon I taught high school geometry. And that was the switch. Like I was not any good at all, but it was so engaging, dynamic. I felt like my creativity was on display. I felt like I was able to take what I knew about engineering and the thinking, the critical thinking that's involved with it and really grow it out within the math context. And, you know, shortly after that, um, while finishing up my master's degree, uh, I uh, did a teaching assistant uh, program um, um, at an independent school. And then I was a tutor and it just kind of went from there. And I was thinking, I went back and got alternative certified and I've been teaching since then. So that's about 20 years now. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, before you move on, Umer, sorry, I'm going to pop a question in here. So you mentioned starting over in the Bay Area, but you're in Atlanta now, right? So yes. how did you? So how did you make your way across? Sure. So, um, so from Howard, Howard University is in Washington D.C. Took yeah. uh, went to graduate school in in the Bay Area. Um, while there, um, a friend of mine and mentor, uh, Orpheus Crutchfield. Um, he does a lot of work in independent schools and, and matching it and helping bringing uh, diverse talent in. Um, through him, I got a chance to um, actually meet other independent schools and some international schools. So I actually went international shortly after I started teaching. So I taught internationally in, um, at the American International School of Johannesburg for four years, then returned back to D.C. in 2000, what was it, 2010? And then met my wife in the summer of 2010, literally like I think a month after I arrived back, I met the woman that I would then marry a few months later, like a, a less than a year later. Um, and then she's from Atlanta. And so we uh, decided that moving to Atlanta would be the best thing for our family, the next best step. And so that's how we ended up in Atlanta. Cool, very cool. Great. Very interesting. Wonderful. Okay, so that is inspiring. So you work in the area of equity, which which we have been talking about a lot uh, lately. You have two central areas of focus in your consultancy work. Can you break down each of these areas for us and what do you, what you do within these areas? Sure. So uh, the best way to describe, like I was actually thinking about this on the walk this morning and we enjoy working, our work is in the margins. Right. And trying to um, empower, not empower, to um, yield power, build power <clears throat> in the in the margins. And so what that looks like for us, the two areas are because I focus on education is how do we what do we need to know and how do we partner with schools to be able to build equitable world class schools? And so we do this through an angle of school improvement um, and that school improvement centers equity. So it's essentially taking. How do we collect smart data? That is data that is inclusive of hard academic and you know measurable data in that way. Also taking interviews, also pulling under every rock and investigating schools and working in that way to really to see what the root causes of inequities within their educational institution. And then partnering to figure out and building capacity to figure out what the ultimate goal would be. When we talk about world-class equitable schools, that is not a What's the word? That is that is not a, a, a one stop definition, right? Because equitable looks different for different schools. It can look different from schools from neighborhood to neighborhood, 
you know, city to city, state to state, country to country, it looks completely different. So what we try and do is center the ability for schools to determine what does world-class equitable mean for them. Um, and then we set a pathway to achieve that. Um, the other area is in, I'm a black and educator convener. And so um, here in the U.S., less than 2% of the teaching population is represented by black male educators. And what that means is that we often, I found myself one, if not the only black male educator in an institution and figured out how to show up every day, how to um, navigate the space, how to um, become, to be authentic and grow. And so I longed for a space to be able to connect um, because internationally, I think I was fortunate enough at uh, the Amer at AISJ to work with uh, one, two other black educators. One was South African, the other was um, uh, American. Um, and so that was few, but you know, even in the international space, there's even fewer of us. And so what we do is create these spaces for them to connect um, and then also grow. It's important for them to, to, to hone their skills, learn new skills, practice them, so that they can then return to their job and thrive. And thriving might be uh maintaining where they're at or finding a new you know rising to a new level within their position but the key is coming together in a way that inspires us to stay within the profession because ultimately i love education and many of the black male educators that i work with love and enjoy uh, working with students working with faculty trying to improve outcomes for their community and so they want to stay and so by creating these professional learning spaces we help them feel like they're valued, they're connected, they're seen, and then they return back to to feel energized and reju rejuvenated, having connected and having a new, having developed and honed some skills so they can thrive on their jobs. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's super important work because I think back to, you know, when we were kids. I'm assuming we we're probably similar in age, and um, like. I, I often wonder about the connections that the teachers that I had would have been able to make with other teachers because professional learning, I don't imagine in the 80s was like it is now, right? I mean, obviously no social media for people to connect to, but how did, you know, with, with so few black male educators, where's the network for people? I, I, I don't know where people would go besides, especially if there's, you know, so few in the profession, it just, it makes me wonder. So I think that the, the work that you and um, Kevin Simpson and, and the guys in the field is, it's so powerful and so meaningful. And, and I can't even imagine um, how the benefits that, that black male educators are getting from the work that you do with them. So that's, it's really amazing. Um, yeah, it's a. If I can just share one one thing. Yeah, so yeah. One of the things is that we are left to to navigate uh, independently, and so what we try and do is find and cultivate mentors, right? And cult and connect with folks. And I've had mentors that are black males. I've had mentors that are white females. I've had a variety of different mentors who um, who I felt had my best interest at heart, and sometimes uh -huh. that best interest pushed me and challenged me. So I think it is. Sometimes by chance, we're able to meet people. And with BME's talk, we don't want it to be a chance anymore. We want to say, come in this space. We had an event um, back in June. On June, we had a just a, a virtual happy hour where we got on for about 90 minutes, played a few games. On that call, one of our, uh, one of our brothers who's in Philadelphia got the call that he got hired as an assistant principal at his school. And just in a community, it was about 30 of us on the call, like all celebrated in that moment. And to be able to see on camera, this is the kind of cool thing that virtual has brought us is that we actually get to see in the people's homes, right? And see them. And so um, so that was really great to see him react. And he was like, I got it, I got it, because he'd been working for so long. And yeah. he had a community to share that within. And if we didn't exist, we might have missed that moment of when he got that call and that feeling. And what that did was, there's some who've been assistant principals and building leaders and superintendents who are in our group, uh, who are who are connected to BME's talk, and then there's others who are inspired, who are aspiring, and they felt motivated and excited to see someone else. So that's what we try and do is we create a space, shape it a little bit, give it a bit of a frame, but really allow the men to 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 experience it the way they want to. Yeah, 
that's really awesome. Yeah. So then um, just thinking about, sorry, Umer, I'm like stealing the questions again, <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> Um, I got all day, don't worry. Or as long as the, the, the battery doesn't run out on my, on my device. Um, but you mentioned um, when you were teaching in South Africa um, how, you know, there was, again, a very small population of black male educators. Do you um, have, I mean, of course, your space is open for any of the educators around the world, but do you have connections still there? Um, or how do you, how's your work going in the international space? Cause I know that that's a huge struggle for, um, educators of color around the, the globe. There's just not, um, really a lot of connected spaces. And I think the, your work and Kevin's work in particular are really together is really powerful for, for educators of color. So do you still have connections there or? Yeah, so there, so at AISJ specifically, there are not black male educators that I know that are there. And we know in the international space, turnover happens. You know, people yeah. move and relocate and things like that. And so the school is, wow, completely different, even just from physically, like looking at the, the grounds and, and what the administration has done there. Um, mm -hmm. But there are one or two people that I stay connected with via Facebook. Um, so social media, um, at most, like... <laughs> Um, uh, Carla and Johan, just really seeing what their families are doing. Um, but I would say that my, my deepest connection is with Kevin. Um, and that's why, you know, working with Kevin Simpson and his association and being a part of that um, leaders of color, educational leaders of color um, work in international spaces has really helped keep, keep me connected um, in that particular space. Just on a call, we had another, I had a training, a virtual training, what was it, this past Thursday, and a brother joined um, the training from uh, the Middle East. And I was like, hey, you know, it's just like, hey, how you doing? I'm glad we got an international. We have a number of people in different places that, are, that connect with us, that connect the BME's talk um, mm -hmm. from around there. And, and I was like, do you know Kevin? He was like, no, I don't know Kevin. You know, I was like, all right, well, I'm going to connect you right away yeah. to, to Kevin in that particular way. And so that's what our community is. Like, I don't say that I know everybody or do everything, but I try and say, I think I know somebody in that state. I think I know yeah. that somebody in that country. We've had some other folks from uh, black educators from the UK who are experiencing similar issues in the work that they're doing within schools, tackling racism, tackling, you know, yeah. dis racial disparities and things like that. So that's how I'm able to stay connected. Uh, with our service of um, equity center school improvement, we actually seek to do that around the globe. Um, and so we, we're excited to be able to connect with organizations and lead school improvement all over. That's one thing that we, we think is really great about our work is that it's not like it's a, it's a framework and a set of tools and we use our expertise, but it's not only something that just works in urban schools in the U.S., Right. It can also be something that is applied in rural schools and uh, in suburban schools, in international, private, you name it, charter, all those other types of spaces. So we look to continue to expand and deepen our work, building a communities of black male educators across the globe, but then also just uh, equitable world class schools. Well, that's awesome. I, okay, I have one question. I'll, yeah. no. I'll leave space for you. Okay. Okay. Um, um, you know, in uh, in my perspective, I know in in United States there are issues for the African American guys. You know, when when we talk about the black black men and women in Pakistan, uh, we actually don't care about color. We have other things to discriminate. I mean, we have certain other levels for discrimination, right? And that is on lighter note. But anyway, uh, what exactly you are trying to do? How you empower the the men and women in the United States, I mean, what kind of trainings you are providing, what kind of tools you are providing, or is it just exclusively for the for the colored educators or colored students, the, the, the students with color and the educators with color, or it is open for everyone, even the white men and women can join you? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, let me just, just push you a little bit um, on there. Like, I, I, I would say that well, I'm, I'm not Pakistani. Like, I think that colorism affects everybody, right? I know that when my wife and I were on, hon and, and on honeymoon in New Delhi and traveled throughout, we, we realized that um, there was a level of colorism, like who was of lighter skin, um, mm -hmm. color there, and then darker skin, mm -hmm. what jobs, like, that's kind of, 
that's how we see the world. Like we travel, we kind of look at like, okay, so what's going on? So I think that it, it is um, to, yeah. to not see color, think we're ways is kind of not knowing that there's an experience behind, beyond, behind that, mm -hmm. right? And so I think it's in, so while mm -hmm. some might not always experience that, that might be the level of privilege that they experience, there are folks who are challenged with that. I mean, even with the, you know, on my continent, on the continent of Africa and other places of darker skin, even, even Asia, lightning skin, right? The skin cream yeah. and all those other types of things are a part of it. So it, there is something there with that, right? That is might slightly vary for each country, but I think underlining all that is, um, could be a more Eurocentric approach to thinking about what humans, what is worth, what is value and things like that. And so mm -hmm. what we do is like, so with, with BME's talk, what we do is just create a space for us to gather and have a voice, right? And so in that space, um, the connect one, because we have so few uh, black men in the profession, it's just, hey, I get a chance to just connect and, and not start from really come in very authentically and openly because there's a shared experience with that. Um, but then in our space, we also provide um, tools for structured conversation. So we do do professional development, but not in a way of here's a new curriculum, here's a new you know behavioral. It's more of like, what skills do you need to know, learn and hone mindsets, knowledge to be more effective on your job, right? And so um, that's what we really focus on and we let the group help dictate that. So we had um, back in February, or February earlier this year, before outside, I say before outside shut down, um, we had a BME's Talk live event. And that live event where we brought 70 educators from across um, Georgia and then some came from Tennessee and Texas and Colorado um, into Atlanta, Georgia. And so what, um, what we did was gather but then also we worked on, you know, part of my work is with the school reform initiative and we had this success analysis tool. So I introduced the tool that they can use with themselves, with teams that they lead, with their colleagues to really unpack success and really not just chalk it up to it was luck, but really be able to pinpoint what it was was successful. And in that they did that in community. So it's basically how to use community to have discussion about success and then we can learn tools or learn strategies that we can then reapply to continue our success. So when we come together, we're always trying to introduce some other tool that they're going to learn that they can go back um, onto their profession, use it within their personal lives or their professional lives in that space. And so um, I think one thing that makes us special is that we don't tell people what they need to learn. What we do is create a space for learning to happen because when men come together, whether virtually or in, or in person, um, I don't know what they will need at their schools to thrive. So we try and have tools that our people can pick up and use and apply in the way that they need. So they understand how this will work in their community, less so than me dictating what they need to do. So I think that has helped to, um, uh, to help people to further wield um, power within the spaces that they work. Um, these tools are not unavailable. They're available to everybody and anybody. And my work in school improvement, also a senior partner, we work with anybody and everybody. Like I said, black, brown, whatever ethnicity, race, however you might say, we work in creating these same spaces together. Um, but BME's talk is about a sacred space for black male educators. Um, but our work also goes beyond that because we also have a have a world that we operate in. That's important to know that it's not 100 percent black males. Um, yeah, it's it's funny that that was a good question, Mayor, and it made me think too as you were talking, Ideally, um, before I knew too much about BME's talk, I saw I think I, it was just after we had met on our first um, advisory call, mm -hmm. and um, and you know Phil Eccles, right? And I know Phil Eccles. And I remember he commented on, there was like a chat going on and I was like, didn't know what BME's chat or talk was really yet. And so I responded to something and then I looked up the chat afterwards. I'm like, oh, I'm not sure if I was supposed to come and join the chat, but I know that that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but it was just one of those funny moments where I was like, oh shoot, maybe I wasn't supposed to jump in, but all good, I know oh, that. So that, that. I think that's one thing that's very, so, that's what I'm excited about what um, 
myself and William Stubbs, who is our uh, program strategist. Uh, he is a, uh, a principal leader um, down in, in Dallas, in the Dallas Fort Worth area. Um, what we've been able to build is a very on, on a very public platform, Twitter, a very yeah. affinity based conversation. And what we say is we want so at, so if you look at at BMES talk, BMES talk um, on Twitter, if you look us up, anybody can follow, anybody can um, retweet and those types of things on Tuesday nights. Um, and actually starting this July, this tu- this Tuesday, July 28th, we will start season four. Anybody and everybody can come and watch. Right. They can like, they can retweet, they can share, they can do all those other things. What we do is we say between 9 p.m. Eastern time and 10 p.m. Eastern time. What we do is say that if you're going to tweet, like actually participate in the chat, we hold that space for black educators. But we want everybody to be watching, right, and retweet. We want folks to know what that, uh, what we're talking about. And actually, if this is not a spoiler alert because we're going to launch this. Our first topic this Tuesday is going to be on police officers in schools. And so a team of us have come together, five of us, uh, black men's kids from across the country have been meeting and thinking about what we're going to do for this this season. And we thought, why not start off with school resource officers? And the interesting part is in planning it, each one of us had a different experience and a different feeling about whether police officers or school resource officers belong in our schools. And so uh, we want people to see this conversation and and the and engage in the way of like and retweet and things like that, but just not to actually tweet on the hashtag because that is essentially like a, a room of brothers having a conversation. Yeah. But anybody and everybody can watch and do all that and then also engage outside of that nine to ten PM. So it's really just one hour once a week we hold for that. Everything else people can use the hashtag. They can use the the handle, let us know and stay communication. Um, that's kind of the interesting part about when you put um, black on something, you know, like a race on something. People think, <laughs> yeah. well, no one else is really invited to that. And it's like, well, it's Twitter. Like, come right. on. It's like it's purposely public so that people can see these conversations. The yeah. thing is, is that we've grown, as you said in the bio, we've grown to expand from Twitter. And the brothers are like, well, so where's our own space? Right. And so we yeah. did. We end up creating virtual happy hours, and then the live events that we have, which are exclusively for Black men educators. Yeah, cool. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And thanks for the clarification, because then that's probably a lot of the parameters around other chats I see. So I know I know the sacred space, but I know that it's still usable. Um, yeah. So um, you had mentioned um, some of the, the school improvement tools, and you use protocols as a way to focus on uh, solution solution um based sorry my my mind is like tangled up now you you use these certain things to help improve schools which are solution based and so um the the thing right now that's hard is that we are facing huge problems so how do you then stay focused on the solutions because we're facing still pandemic homeschool online racism, all sorts of things. So how is it that you guys are able to just like maintain that focus? Because, you know, it's, it's, there's huge problems right now. Sure. So, I mean, so the, the, in order to get to solutions, it's important to understand that we have to be able to collect and that is my daughter who just walked behind me. Hi, baby. <laughs> Come on here. here just for a moment. She, she's up this morning. Say hello. Hi. Introduce yourself. My name is Ethan Tayo. Oh, it's nice to meet you. All right. Thank you. Can I hug? <laughs> Give me a moment. All my right. That's child. my coworker. Yeah. A, fr- a, awesome. friend of mine, a friend of mine said uh, a few weeks, you know, when, when everything kind of started the way it was, it's like we now have more coworkers. Right, which are our family members in our house. Um, yeah. But uh, so, so we, so I think, so I think I was at where um, solutions. We understand that solutions are very, very important, and we have to be making progress. The key to our work within school improvement is collecting smart data and smart evidence to power what the solution will actually be. So we spend a significant amount of time actually partnering with schools to really look at and unpack and investigate and actually collect data on 
the entire school environment, total school learning environment. So we have five different dimensions that we look at, right? And then what we try and do is figure out how do we center or hear the voices and the experiences of all community members, teachers, staff, students, parents, community, building leaders, district leaders, how do we center their information in the data that we're actually collecting so that we know that the solution we design are actually inclusive and are actually appropriate for all that are there? Um, one of the things I was thinking about this morning on the walk was this idea of it is hard to center those who are out at the margin if we don't know that they're on the margin. And so the way that we know is to really look at our environment, seeking to get everybody's voice. So we can give people a seat at the table, but sometimes that might take time, right? And I'm not saying, you know, there, there are two camps, blow up the table, build your own, so on and so forth. But what, but what we like to look at is, okay, how do we help schools or individuals or organizations that are trying to give people a seat at the table? How do we help them collect enough information to understand what that voice and that story is. And that voice and that story and that experience comes through vocal interviews, right? But then it also comes through, we actually in our work, we go into schools and we do observations. We observe classrooms, we walk the hallways, we look at everything. So it's not just what people are telling us, but it's also what we see. What we see in classroom instruction. How do we see um, adults interacting with each other in the building? How do we do all those other particular things. And then we take that baseline information and then we have a collective meeting with community to say, hey, this is what we found across these domains. What do you think are the next best steps? What are you seeing in this particular data that allow us to then chart a path, right? Because part of this, you know, the third phase of, of um, school improvement is a strategic plan. Well, that plan has to, has, it is best, it, it, the best solutions come when we have enough evidence from all those particular places to then yeah. be able to design and figure out what does an equitable world-class school look like for us. And so that's how we get to the solution, but we don't come in with a solution. You know, so many right. times it's like, oh, well, you need behavioral management. Oh, you need right. more curriculum. Or you're teaching me to go there when sometimes student behavior, let's just, if we if we go from, from students, right? Or, we center students a lot. Let's say, well, that's important. Let's say we have to understand that um, sometimes our students' experience on the bus ride coming into school is what affects them. And so do we, for those schools that have transportation, how often are you spending time talking with your bus drivers to understand what it's like? Are we actually building culture on the bus? Because that is the first place that kids come in contact in certain communities, come in contact with the school is the bus system, right? Yeah. And so it's like that might, so we don't talk to our bus driver. If we don't collect the, the information, what's happening on our on our bus, what behaviors are issuing, you know, do we collect data about what's actually happening on our buses, right? We're missing an opportunity to figure out like, the child's difficulty paying attention might come from an experience on the bus, not anything else that's happening in the school. So if we keep changing what's happening in the school, we're, we're missing potentially an area. So this is why we, we look at this 360 degree approach to really say like, oh, because there might be some lower hanging fruit and more expensive oppor you know, opportunities to engage folks to improve um, the way schools meet uh, learning needs of, of students within that. So that's our work. And again, we don't prescribe ourselves to know exactly what's happening. We just come with a lot of questions and an openness and an expertise to, 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 to be able to develop and understand so we can cultivate solutions. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Really powerful work. Um, Umer, do you have any more questions before Ideli I'm tells good. about? I'm your I'm digesting a lot yeah. of things. Oof. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's yeah. heavy work. It's a lot. It is. Um, so Aya Deli, we will finish off the show today with you giving us some details about some upcoming events that you have, because I'm sure, sure. people are going to want to connect and get in touch. Okay. Um, so we have, so in terms of the, the school improvement work that we do, which is Equity Center School Improvement, um, we have several, we have two trainings coming up, one in September and one um, in uh, October. And where you can find that is 
cbventures.eventbrite.com. And there's a list of all of our um, school improvement training that's happening for there. Um, okay. For our work with BME's Talk, you can go to bmestalk.com and learn more about um, our work. And then under the events tabs are all the events that are, are coming up for Black Men Educators. Um, but as always, like the, the quick and, and easy way, you can find me on, on Twitter at um, Twitter and Instagram at Iodeli underscore H-A-R 78. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, Iodeli Harrison Connect. There you can learn, um, see what I'm thinking about, resources that I'm sharing, things that I'm learning, you know, um, and I also have a podcast called Iodeli Speaks. You can find that on Spotify, uh, let me see, Anchor and, and a couple other platforms where I'm just sharing what it means for me, what's coming up for me. Like one of the examples that one of the episodes that I, that I posted a few weeks ago was I'm doing at home learning for my daughter. Right. And so what does that look like? What am I struggling with? And then also I had one where it's like my daughter's watching more than five hours of television a day because of my wife and I have to work and some of the child care that we had set up like that is just what happens, you know? Yeah. And, and it's That's like it's right so now. On, on my on my podcast, I just share just kind of what happens as a parent, as an educator, so on and so forth. So you can definitely connect with me there. And, and, um, and I look forward to connecting with folks and continue to building relationships with you both as well. Yeah, no, no, that's awesome. I'll put all the links up on our Twitter page and our Facebook page um, so that people can find out more about all of the things that you're doing and, and learning because I know that we're all in the space right now where there's just a lot of stuff going on and we're all learning together. So um, I wanna thank you so much for your time. Ideally, apologies again for the lateness on the YouTube end, but all good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you very much and we'll, we'll talk soon. Thank you so much. Thank you very much and uh, for being with us and uh, this show which has been done today on Facebook Live, that will be also available on YouTube channel. So the viewers who have been watching us, for the, for the last 30 minutes. I think this is 37 minutes now. Yeah. So do subscribe to our YouTube channel as well and uh, do share our uh, uh, episodes with your colleagues, with your friends. We will be coming up with another wonderful educator next time. Next time is next week? Uh, no, not next week, probably the week after, just getting some people in, in order. Great. We are actually ordering people. So, <laughs> so, good morning, good evening, good night, everyone. Thank you very much.